We're going to be doing a real-world decision-making case and have uh, the presenters come and kind of give their opinions on how they would handle various cases. Um, I really appreciate you uh, sending all the questions in via text. Uh, we're getting a lot of fantastic questions. Um, if we have time, we're going to be getting to them a little bit. Um, but I still want you to send in the questions. What we're going to do is compile them and distribute them to the speakers. And then we're going to email you back with the responses to these questions that you're sending. So please continue to send questions. So our case, if you could bring the case up on the screen. So. Our case here is a 59-year-old male, uh, past medical history of hypertension, a left knee medial metastectomy after basketball injury 20 years previously, now presenting with left knee pain for the last six months, progressively worsening with no inciting events, swelling, medial pain, worse with activity. A recent MRI showed a grade three medial compartment OA, uh, a bone marrow lesion in the medial tibial plateau, moderate joint effusion, and medial meniscus degenerative tearing and extrusion. Physical exam showed a mild varus of the, lead knee, uh, the left knee, tentative palpation of the medial joint line with pain in deep knee flexion, mild laxity with MCL stress testing, and pain with thessalies. So what we're going to do is have anyone join in. <laughs> Whoever wants to go first. Okay. So thank you. Testing? Okay. Well, first of all, at, at 59, if I'm his doctor, he's always going to be young because I'm 56. <laughs> yeah. so we're not going to give in. But uh, this, is, this is a very common presentation in probably all of our clinical offices. And the two orthobiologics that I use primarily just because of where I'm at and, and my training are, are PRP and bone marrow concentrate. And obviously, the guy sitting next to me is presenting compelling data on a SVF, and we can talk about that. But for me, I present both of the orthobiologics that I use to this patient. I have a whiteboard in every room, and we run through the pros and cons of each as I understand them based on the current data. And there's differences in length of outcome. There's differences, obviously, in invasiveness. Um, not really a big difference in complications in my experience, actually. Difference in cost is significant. Uh, I'm not scared by the fact that he has something showing meniscal degenerative tearing or pain flexion. I've seen those go away with orthobiologic treatment. I don't think it's an indication for surgery out of the gate. In fact, quite to the contrary, I think a year down the road, if we, if we uh, look at these patients, that they're pretty much doing the same whether they have surgery or not if we do a good orthobiologic. So I would present either option. I, it would be hard for me to say whether or not I would uh, recommend one over the other. I want the patient to make that decision once they have all the data. I don't do a lot of intraosseous because with my high-dose PRP, for example, I've seen good results out to a year, and with BMC, I've seen good results out to a couple years. So I don't do a lot of intraosseous at this point. Okay. Dr. Rogers. Yeah, I also agree <clears throat> that this patient is young. <laughs> uh, um, but this patient um, is young at heart, right? He likes to play pickleball, he likes to ski, he likes to jog all really good things for a bad knee, right? So it's like, why couldn't he pick swimming? But, um, so there's a little expectation management discussion that has to go on with this patient. Um, usually the patient, when they come to us, they've already tried, you know, things that we won't talk about, steroids, HA, et cetera. We, didn't, we don't list the patient's uh, BMI. That would be of interest if there's a weight loss issue. There's obviously a lot of good data that uh, managing weight can help with pain. Um, I also like the patients to have a slightly higher BMI because I'm going to be looking to see if I'm going to take some of their fat, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, I educate the patient. I say, you know, first of all, let's just get some reality around the nature of this injury. He's in a more severe category. However, we have good data for safety with PRP. We have good data for bone marrow safety, and we have good data for MFAT safety. We don't have, unfortunately, good placebo-controlled randomized clinical trials for bone marrow and for MFAT. However, you know, once you start getting, you start seeing some of these long-term outcomes, you know, look at the Regenix data that goes out many, many years. You look, there's some MFAT studies that goes out, you know, three years. 
we can start to say that we think there's at least some efficacy in the two, three year range. Um, we certainly don't promise that this patient's gonna completely regenerate their knee. That's just not a reality. But we are gonna help manage their pain and their inflammation. Um, and then, of course, physical therapy has to be talked about. We, we actually have a gym in our clinic where we'll make them do a variety of different functional tests and see if there's any rehab goals that need to be addressed. So that's for everybody. Um, for the future, of- for, and just one last point is, you know, a lot of times folks come to me and they ask, you know, what about cultured cells? What about SVF? And unless they qualify for one of the studies, uh, they, they just can't get that yet. But the data, if you look at the data, is pretty compelling for long term. We actually have five year follow up data for cultured adipose MSCs showing changes on MRI, uh, at, certainly after three years. So um, I think the future looks brighter every year that we see more data on this type of patient. We, we heard from the two private practice docs. How about the two academicians? So since I do all three of them, PRP, bone marrow, and lipoaspirate, um, I always try to walk him through what that harvest and process is like, and that helps the patient with a little bit of self-selection. There's some people that would never do bone marrow aspiration concentration, uh, and there's some folks that just don't, they just say, give me the one that you like the most. So I walk him through the process to kind of help him with the decision-making process. There's a little bit of effusion over there, so I try to aspirate the knee prior to doing the procedure. And I also want to stress the prehab and the post rehab uh, for the procedure, whichever one we do. And lastly, but not the least, maybe a little bit of trepanation of the meniscus as well to see if we can kind of get a better result. It might not be completely be the reason, but why not do that, do more of a functional unit type treatment? I agree with everything. A bit, ooh, I agree with everything being mentioned. Perhaps we could try heel wedges too. Maybe lateral heel wedges, since she or this person already has a virus um, already at the knee. So maybe we can write that and see if we can gap the medial joint. That would be the only thing. I know. I'm sorry. This is not all the biological comments, but uh, um, <laughs> biomechanics <laughs> always catches me. So that's fantastic. There are some comfortable medial unloader braces. Yeah. They're not all comfortable, but They're there are all. some that are comfortable that patients will tolerate. Someone this active may not want that in their life, but that's something that's part of the discussion too. And it's all important points. I mean, realistically, we gotta talk about the different orthobiologic options, but we can't forget that the orthobiologics are really only one piece of the puzzle when it comes to treating patients. And beyond the data, beyond the information, the prehab, the rehab, the bracing, the heel lifts, all of that plays into factor. So really fantastic discussion. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions right now, but please keep them coming. A round of applause for the panel. (laughs) 